We've all got scars, some on the outside and some on the inside, but we can't be defined by our scars. I've spoken with some extraordinary people about how they've become empowered by their scars. This is I've Got Scars, baby. So I am really excited. We have a very, very amazing show a very powerful story. I have with me today Ms. Kendra Hall, and she is an author, a motivational speaker, and she is a survivor. Yes, she's been through some stuff, but you can't tell by looking at her, because look at her, she's just <laughs> over there looking purdy. Aww, look at you over there. Thank you. Look at all fly. I see you. Mm-hmm. But you, you, as they say, I don't look like what I've been through. Right. And, and, you know, uh, on this show, so many people don't look like what they've been through. And you are absolutely one of those people. I'm so happy to have you on. I definitely am interested. When I heard your story, I was just like, child, what? What's going on? Like, you just, yes. And you have, a, you have a book. We'll talk about the book a little later. But you have a book called Dropping Jewels. And it's about your life story and what you've experienced and so yeah let's go ahead and dive on in let's dive on in so what 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 is your story you said how did you grow up well i grew up with in a two-parent household in upper middle class and i had a lot of things going on at the time i was in a lot of extracurricular activities dance dance troop leader the church, um, <laughs> the church uh, group leader, the church youth group leader, usher board, group, junior usher board anyway. I was volunteering at uh, playhouses and being able to also watch the plays for free and, and hobnobbing with the actors. I was taking professional acting lessons. So that was something I was doing. You know, all these things were going on as a child and it seemed, and I had a very structured life. So both of my parents have, have their master's degree and they were very much set, dead set on ensuring that we, as there's four of us, uh, sibling wise, and um, that we were all educated and not just educated by the regular school system, the, um, but to get that extra, extra edge. And that took place by being fed encyclopedias where we had to uh, write, essays and uh, read the dictionary and be able to explain what the words meant and use them in, state, in statements and sentences at a very young age because my parent, my mother's a re now a retired educator. So education was very, very important. And so socialization was not, or not over socializing if it wasn't for church or, mm -hmm. or school, uh, school functions. So I was really in a very structured household. And so the there was no talk about um, boyfriend, girlfriend situations. There was, uh, I was 12 at the time, uh, if I'm gonna go back to this, this, this point in life, to whereas my father told me, just don't have sex. And my, you know, that was, the, there's no sex, that's it. And I think that that was the extent of it. Um, at the time, you know, there was no explanation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, does that resonate with you? I'm sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was, I, I always say, like, <laughs> I wouldn't, if it was up to my mom and my dad, I would, at this point, I still wouldn't know where babies came from. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> it was just like, we did not really cover all of that. You know, no shade to mom and dad, but just saying, we didn't really get into the depths of it. It was just kind of like, don't do none of that. And yeah, so I get you. <laughs> okay, so exactly. I saw, sister, you understand, you understand. <laughs> Mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. that you know and when you're not educated about sex and just hearing things from your friends at school or whatever they tell you at uh, or for your in your surroundings and uh, in general your peers as well as what you learn at school again you know that that combination is deadly for a young person out there to not know their uh why it is that no one should have sex, why it is that no one should be doing these certain behaviors, and it's just cut and dry as opposed to giving some type of reasoning that will stick in that child's subconscious mind as to why 
and build their foundation mm -hmm. um, and at least give them a principle to stand upon as to why they're not doing this particular action or thing. So, I mean, I think that, you know, going back to that time of 12 and being told that by my father, um, and that led me to, uh, you know, had that stuck in my mind, but it really kind of, I didn't understand the reasoning behind it. At the time, at 12, I had a boyfriend, a secret boyfriend. <laughs> and he would come up to the, <laughs> I had a secret boyfriend. And um, so he would come up to the church and to youth group and we would find ways to, to meet up and all of that. And, you know, I had my first kiss behind the church van. Uh, <laughs> a mess a mess and it's not funny but it, it is kind of when you think about these times and you kind of like wow i can't believe that this happened um to this to, to the way it did because you're you you know and i feel like um going through trying to sneak around and then having to um to come to a point where i decided to at 13 with that same boyfriend have sex we made the decision together Wow. And then that, that first time. I got to ask you a question <laughs> a little bit. So with your parents, did you pick up any type of this is how mommy and daddy do it? And let me try to connect the dots. Did you try to connect the dots between how your parents interacted with one another? Is that the only information you had to go on? Or was it just like, I'm just curious. No, I was, in, I was, I was, you know, I thought I was in love. I was a young girl. I had been dating this boy for, you know, in my secretly dating, if you want to call it, whatever that was, because we only really talked on the phone on three way, <laughs> or we, you know, I'm try to, we weren't able to get three way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, all 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 line. Line. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. So, you know, sneaking around and, and doing those things as a young person and catching moments at church or finding moments at the library, at school, together. I mean, there's really no real way to date at 13, 12, and 13 years old. Yeah. You know, okay. um, beyond the, the, the things that 12 and 13-year-olds are allowed to do. Um, and so the, how I got pregnant was we skipped, decided to skip school one day. So 13, y'all decide to have sex. Right. He's 14. I'm 13. Okay. okay. Right. So we decided to we decided to have sex. We you know we thought we were both in love. Yeah. And the first time I had sex, and he was actually planning to get me pregnant, which I didn't know at the time. Whoa. Yes. Oh my. First of all, I, like I would be as a little as a fourteen year old, you would think you would be scared to even think about that or to know really much about what getting somebody pregnant is really involves. Well, I think that, you know, he had a different experience, even though he, you know, he had a different experience and he was in a, a faster mindset than I was at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think also, um, you know, he was telling me that we were going to get married and live in his, his family's house down south. I think he really, at, as you know, and that's why I discourage young relationships, because you get filled with uh, these types of thoughts that uh, they are grandiose that you really can't fully deliver on. Um, because you're just a child. And yeah. I think that, but you feel like you can, you feel like these are possibilities in your head and they're just not reality. And you get a hard dose of reality when you don't follow those guidelines and understand where your role is and stay in your lane as a child. Yeah. Wow. So 13, you have sex. The first time you have sex? The first time. First time. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so, and I hit it because I didn't know what to do for months. Wow. And so, you know, I wound up um, having to confess because one of the school professionals, um, she noticed what was going on, the guidance counselor. And she said, if you don't tell your parents and I will, I'm going to have to do it. And you better tell them today. And so I had to, you know, I had to, to make that decision to tell my parents. And um, it was a very hard decision because when, when do you find that courage, especially a child who's really scared of their parents? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that was very, you know, it was a tough time in, in, in learning about myself and what type of courage I can muster up. I had the courage to do 
the, the thing that I wasn't supposed to do, but now it was time to be accountable. Yeah. Wow. So you tell your parents and what, how did they react? Well, they did not react well. I didn't think they would. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know your parents. And I'm like, child, just from what you said, Lord, Lord. Okay. Ooh, no, the, it was not a good scene. Um, and, you know, my mother fell out literally oh god yes and uh you know and and that was very hard to see as and i felt awful at the time of course i still do of course you know that that action had to happen mm -hmm. um but things things uh you know things you don't you don't think of the consequences as a young person mm -hmm. of your decisions of, in a lot of situations you just kind of think of what you want now uh the impulse control is not there yet mm -hmm. in a lot of situations when you're in that uh that 13 14 15 stage um so it's that's why it's kind of that's why my book is so important because it gives these young people especially young women guidelines as and lifelines that's that's another uh way to look at it as a lifeline in order to not make those same mistakes and uh the book is not so much about my story as it is about the lessons that i learned mm -hmm. so that's really the highlight it's it's about the jewels that i picked up along the way the lessons that have really molded and shaped me and i do use a lot of uh, situations that I went through to highlight uh, what it is that needs to be honed in on as far as what the lessons are uh, for these young people. Wow. So your mom, you, you tell your mom, you tell your parents, your mom literally passes out in front of you. I would, she, you, she didn't, I would say she fell out. She fell out. I wouldn't say a full, you know, she wasn't, she, <laughs> she was still right. She was down. Right, it wasn't, it was a, good, like, it wasn't a good look. Down. I right, it was not it. right. Agreed. Yeah. So, what does that next step look like? What well, then my father came home, and so that didn't go well. So I was told to tell him, and then there was a lunch that was held back. You know, because because you know he wanted to go come for me because it's, you, your child is telling you that they're that that they're pregnant and I and that is a shock so it you know it was very it was a very highly emotional scene and a highly emotional situation and um, not to give the whole book away uh, in essence of the storyline uh, of, of my story which is based upon my story there are a lot of things that I wasn't able to even put into the book there's going to be many books after this I'm actually writing a second book uh, now that should be out next year and, um, you know, but in, in terms of the journey of, you know, telling my parents and their reaction was really, really one of uh, detriment. They felt as though that life was, you know, it was like doom and gloom, of course, your child is, and, you know, in their mind, pregnant. And, and one, of the other, one of the other things my father said was, you know, how embarrassing it was for the family uh, that, you know, they prop that probably everybody knew except for them and their minds so you know just the shame that of, of that and itself and how did you feel in this moment you know like what was it for you did you just feel work like that has to do a lot to your self-esteem that has to do a lot to how you see yourself and view yourself in that moment at 13 years old did you just kind of want to crawl into a hole and just never come out like how did you i did yeah <laughs> I mean, at the time, yes, you know, at the, at the, at that, those moments, absolutely. Because, um, you know, there was no real safe space in my mind, except for me really praying, um, because I had prayer and that's what I went to. Um, in addition, um, I had the, I had in my mind, I still have, I have my baby. So I had those hopeful things in my, in my mind and that, uh, feeling of, just the gloom of not knowing what my next place will be. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that even though I'm, I'm going through the situation, I don't know where I'm going to be placed at. My other thought is I'm, I'm still thinking about the child's father, right? So my yeah. child's father. So thinking of that, what is going to become of that relationship? And, you know, how am I going to, how is that going to stay maintained? Because that was extremely important to me 
because that, that was a focal point. Um, you know, to, that was a distraction in, in essence as well. Um, to have that, this focusing on a relationship as opposed to focusing on what do I need for me and my, for myself and my child to live, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but I'm, fo I was focusing on all these other, other uh, things that didn't matter, that weren't going to help me, that were not going to elevate me out of that situation. Um, and, and so I, so that's part of, again, the book of learning how to, to think differently. So if you find yourself in certain situations, you're able to think in a way that you're not boxing yourself in and just not getting anything done because you're wallowing in your own self-pity and or worrying, worried about the wrong things that don't really, uh, will not level you up in life, but only keep you at the same level, if not, you know, level you down. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So what happens? You you have your child. Uh, so you have your Well, baby. I'm put out first. Oh. I'm not. So you, oh, I'm put out. Oh. Oh, honey. I yes. was wondering about that because I'm like, oh, no, are I'm you gone. in the house? <laughs> no, he, no, I was put out. So oh, I was, God. yes, it was no, it, no. He, so I was, I, I was offered to, to give the baby up for adoption. My, my, if I was able to go to this special school where you wear these long dresses and you act like you're on summer vacation and That's then you give your thing. baby up, I it's a real thing. Movies, but it's real. Oh, wow. Yes. So I was offered to go. I saw a video. So I was offered to go to this place. And if I get went to this place, I'm sure, you know, that then I would, you know, and gave the baby up or you never see the child, you know, they just take it and they just whisk you away and they basically... Uh, then you would come back. So I would. I did not take that as an as an an option. So um, that was definitely not something that I wanted was to give my child up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say if those who have that's a personal decision, but it was not the decision that I wanted for myself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I told my father that that was not an option, then everything broke loose in the worst way because he said, you're going to, you're out the house. There's not, there was no option. And I was, you know, I, I then I was, I was forced to, to live with, uh, until let's not give the whole book away. <laughs> let's not give the whole book. So after that, it just really became a very, um, a, a very challenging journey of, of being out on my own and having to deal with a lot of the wolves of the world. And that's what I would say, because when you're out as a young girl in the world, there's many different, uh, there's tr so many different traps and so many different people looking to, uh, to fill a void with you mm -hmm. because they don't feel like anybody is, you know, is, is, thinks is they may be, they may not be thinking anybody cares about you, thinks about you, mm -hmm. and or they may not value, value you as a child being out on your, you're still somebody who they feel like they want to have authority over. Um, and I speak of that as the adults that are around you in your world as a child, um, because that's who holds the power. And so, you know, keeping that in mind, if, you know, in a lot of situations, you're not, you're, you're too young to be able to make a lot of the decisions that will be able to um, elevate you in life. Like you can't get, you know, at, at 15, you can't get at your own place right? <laughs> because you're not old enough. Yeah. Uh, not legally anyway. Yeah. Um, so you have to find different ways to be able to, uh, to live, to grow, to move, to work, um, you know, because you still have to provide for your child. So there's so many different uh, elements that come along with it. One thing I'm thankful is that my parents always raised me to move about fast. And I was always, like I said early on, busy work, move. There was no oversleeping. I got up. I was in a routine. I got up on the weekends. I was always up in the mornings. Um, and even now I'm up, you know, and I have been like this since I was a, a, a teenager up at 4 a.m. So wow. every day. So I'm up at 4 a.m. So that is, and I'm moving shake. I'm not here to, you know, I, 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 I really did adopted the, the ideal of I'm not here to play <laughs> yeah. even you know that type of mentality because I had to and I had to er learn that early on to get be up be ready to get up and go out it doesn't matter if it's cold outside if it's hot outside do what you need to do in order to be productive for your day 
And so, you know, however you feel, push through it. And so because I had that already within me and I had to do a lot of things that I thought were very, very boring, very young and having to sit and do, um, you know, uh, do items that, or, you know, do, do exercises that uh, writing this or doing that, uh, that I did not care for, let, let's say, or one of the, the big things my parents uh, were very serious about was, and you'll see me doing it now, <laughs> uh, were, was to lose any filler words. So there were, there was, there were no uh, us, right there was there was no us i had to start a sentence all over again if i if it didn't make sense to them or wasn't complete so they were very much into um structuring me in a way that i can speak properly and that was very very helpful in order to get gain the respects of the adults that would listen because being able to speak in the way that they could understand and not in just slang form yeah. um, really elevated me from some of the other teenagers that were around me at the time which is very key because they looked at you as more intelligent because you were uh talking they're speaking their language language in essence and acting acting as though you were able to, you weren't going to always look for a ha handout. In essence, like you're willing to work and do what you needed to do in order to get the help or assistance that you needed. So, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> here's the thing, cause there's a lot, there's a lot here. I feel like a lot to un un unpack. And I wanna, I wanna talk about your parents and that relationship mm -hmm. in a few. But I know that there's something else that, you know, because the day to day, I want to, I, like the day to day, because you're on your own, you've been at this point on your own since you're like 13, mm -hmm. 14 years old. Um, you're out of the house. I'm imagining you and the father are trying to work things out. I, I don't know. Are you... But then there's, there's more. It's not just, I had one child. There's, you know, when you're, when you're that young, your emotions are kind of all over the place. You're having a child, there's work and stuff to like, you become an instant adult and that right. just is nuts. So what was that experience like for you? Like, what was it? Because I know, like I said, it, it wasn't just, okay, I have, one child to take care of it, it 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 was you were on your own for a while right i think that and that's that's a very good question as far as what the day-to-day -day, you know thoughts are for a person who's in that situation is so young and for me i i was fueled a lot on being angry being and and not just not angry at the world but just angry at the fact that I was not, um, I had to, to fight so hard for the adults in my life to listen, that were around me to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was very frustrating for me. Yeah. And so that was a lot of the day-to-day -day thoughts of having to deal with people who I didn't feel like had my best interests at heart, but I was at their mercy. Yeah. And that was very, very hard in certain situations because I'm still a young person out on my own and day to day is rough because I have to still, you know, and, and there's a difference between, you know, my situations at different times because I'm living in different places mm -hmm. uh, in certain situations. Um, you know, I was at 16, my son's father and I had our place together. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a situation where I thought that things would be perfect and work out and um, we were planning to get married and we were going to have his parents sign, well, his uh, grandmother sign his papers and have my mother sign the papers and all of this. And, but there was a lot of domestic violence going on, you know, that I was not, and you can't, it's, I, I can't say, can't say anybody would be prepared for, but definitely not as a young person trying to learn herself and know who I am at that stage. So having to deal with the domestic violence situation uh, with with uh, my son's father was extremely uh, pivotal in my in in my life. So that day to day changed after dealing with that type of situation on a daily basis. And I wouldn't say it was a daily abuse. I would say that um, it's a mental toll on you. 
when whenever situations like that happens it's just it's more of a mental toll because you don't know when it's going to happen again yeah and so you want to trust that the situation won't happen again but then it may happen sporadically and you just don't understand how to prevent it the next time in your mind as a young person because you're you know that's a lot of the thoughts that are going through your head and for me when i was thrown through a double glass window in our bedroom then oh it was time for me to leave so i went to a domestic violence shelter um, at that time and then you know life got even more interesting <laughs> in essence so again a lot of this is in uh the book so yeah. i want to encourage those to to take a look at the book read find the lessons that you need to um to propel you to the next level and they, this is a faith-based book because a lot of the ways that i was able to mentally get through these situations was and spiritually and not to not have a broken spirit because everything around me at the, those times is it felt like it was trying to break me and i couldn't i told myself that i was not going to break and that god had pat my back because i felt like he did and i in my spirit mm -hmm. and so i was still able to thank goodness that i had that background of going to church monday wednesday saturday sunday twice yeah, right. <laughs> so right it was helpful to have that to because I, I didn't just go to sit there, I went there to learn. Yeah. And I was able to actually pull some of the lessons and apply them um, and try to also analyze how I could do better in situations. Because again, I was taught to analyze as a younger adult, you know, in essence. So uh, yeah. those types of lessons I always say are so important to share with your children because it gives them the foundational principles that they need in order, because no one knows what's going to happen in life. You want to prepare your children for life as soon as, you know, as much as possible in a, in a gentle way, uh, not in a way that's, that they're already in it and it's harsh. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I do have to ask, as it pertains to your parents, because you've experienced at this point you've experienced domestic violence and now you're going to a shelter what do you wish your parents would have done differently in that with that whole experience well i wish that my i wish that at the time that my parents were accepting of the fact that this was a something that if they had they spoken to me may have been prevented mm -hmm. so i feel like if they had had a better way of communicating with me or communication style or tried harder as opposed to being so cut and dry mm -hmm. and this is either this or that black or white there was no middle ground and that to me was very hard to uh to deal with because there were a lot of curiosities and questions that I had that I felt like I couldn't feel safe to ask without being accused of maybe doing that thing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just have to say, because a lot of times when it's, when people are very religious or, you know, a lot of times in a religious uh, setting, the concept of bringing up sex, you know, at least in the Christian church, from my experience, it's not always necessarily the thing. It's just kind of like the thing you don't do, the thing you don't talk about. And it's like, well, it's a very natural part of life. But like you said, as a child, you just wanted to know, well, why don't you? You know, children are very curious. They want to know, you know, they're not trying to get in into trouble, into drama, into, you know, they're not trying to get into shenanigans necessarily, you know, some might, but it's like education. If you're, if you're going to say, Hey, let me educate you by giving you the dictionary. It's like, well, let me educate you also about life. And so I just want to encourage any parents, anyone, uh, you know, cause you, you, I imagine as a, as a parent, you're very, nervous for your children especially growing up where it can be a whole bunch of you know they're getting so many messages from you know media and 
and kids at school or whatnot. And you want your, your child to stay on the, the, the straight and narrow path as much as they can and to be successful. But I think it's just about educating them and letting them know, hey, you can come talk to me about these things. Because it sounded like that's really all you wanted was to have the open communication. I did. I did. I, that's what I truly wanted. I didn't want to feel accused. Yeah. I didn't, I did not want to feel um, rejected. And I think that's a big thing as a young person. We want to feel that acceptance, acceptance from, from our loved ones. Yeah. And so when we don't get that, or we don't feel as though that's going to be, that's going to happen, we shy away from the thing that we want or need in order to, uh, to get to the next step in our, in our, in our development, our personal development. You know, it stunts us when we're not able to communicate effectively. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I really wish that I was able to find the, the proper words and the proper courage at that time to say to my parents, it doesn't matter in my mind thinking, it doesn't matter what the re response is, but just getting it off of my chest at that time. Because it's something that at least um, for them, that they would feel like uh, also that they could have that clarity. So it's not just for me, but it's just for them because I think also be parents are just people mm -hmm. and we can't expect so much from them in terms of their, them being the super parent and knowing exactly how to approach every situation. And it took me to, to become a parent to learn that. And so that's one of the things that um, the book does is also to teach the, the parents yeah. what, is, what are some proper techniques and ways to address the situation of teen pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah, because I imagine as a parent, you have an idea of where, where you want your children to go and what you want them to do. And you have a blueprint in your mind for what, who they should be, how they should move about the world. But everybody's experience is, is different. And so do you feel like, do you feel like as you have kind of grown and moved and done things on your own, uh, had your relationship as you got older, did your relationship change with your parents? Did you guys? Oh. Absolutely. It's changed tr tr tremendously. And I, you know, I definitely think that when you're doing better and you're doing, or you're in essence doing well to, to whatever that degree is that people feel like you are, uh, that they're more welcome to your presence. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was doing bad in their minds, whatever they consider bad, then I don't know if I would be as welcome in their presence. Mm -hmm. So I understand the nature of people. And I think that that is a lot of times with the nature of a lot of people um, and a lot of, whether family or not, that you're, they're more welcome to uh, be open as you're no longer a burden to them or you're not going to be a burden in their lives. Now, that, that's heavy to me. That, that feels so heavy because it makes me think, when you think about parents, you think about if there, there's anybody in the world that you feel like if I'm just barely making it or if I'm not really at my best, <laughs> you want your parents to be like, all right, boo, I love you. Come on into the house. Come get some of right. you know, <laughs> these hugs and kisses, you know? And so you think about this concept of unconditional love. Right. And so that's, but the only way you can do that is if you remove your, your need for the other person to your expectation of them to be a certain way. And right. how did that feel for you to, you know, cause obviously you came through all of this, you know, mm -hmm. and you're shining and you're doing so very well. Oh, thank I you. mean, thank it's you. just the truth. I mean, cause everybody can, but some people may not have handled it the way you've handled it. They, they may not have, you know, this is definitely a show about taking your, your uh, lemons and turn it into lemonade. This is that kind of show. But everybody 
has a different temperament. I like to say it like that. Everybody has a, another, you know, they're just kind of wired a little bit different. And so somebody may not have said, you know what, let me take all of these experiences and uh, let me write a book. Let me, you know, go and do some motivational speaking. Let me, you know, make this work for me. What do you, what would you say to a person that really is just struggling because they're like, I feel like in my, I feel like I wanted to be the very best that I could be and I failed in this area. And I feel abandoned, whether it's by parents or friends or say the father of their child just didn't show up for them and didn't take care of the child. You know, what do you say to the person that just feels like everybody has given up on me? I would say number, the first thing is to feel. You don't want to not to shut off your feelings and not to feel how you feel. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's a lot of times what we tell a person, oh, it's going to be okay. You know, dry your eyes, get back up, chin up. And that's not good for your mental health. Mm -hmm. So it's time when you feel as though you're in a proverbial fog, that's God telling you it's time to change some things. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about rewiring your, your mind to get focused on the positive even in the midst of feeling the negativity. Um, and, and if you so deem it to be, because sometimes you can feel a certain feeling, that doesn't mean that it's a negative feeling. It's just how you feel. Um, and so I think that the first thing I would say is to feel it and, and in all its capacity and uh, with, uh, without trying to judge it, without trying to think about it. And one of the ex exercises that I have for people who are feeling really frustrated is to take that long car ride where there's no one around in essence and, you know, yell at the top of your lungs, uh, scream, pull over if you need to cry, you know, at a safe place um, in a rest stop now, of course, nowadays, <laughs> you can't just pull over like, you know, in essence, but, you know, find that safe space for you that you feel comfortable yelling, crying, screaming, uh, feeling, yeah. and, and let those emotions out at, you know, just, just go through the exercise and do it as an exercise of one after the other and try to try to feel how you're feeling and also write down how you're feeling, mm -hmm. write yourself a letter. That's why it's so important to journal. Because you need to empty out your head. You're, a lot of times we're storing so much. And if we're not exercising to release a lot of the stress that's built up within us, mm -hmm. it's very hard to find an out for the stress. It's just sitting in our bodies and our minds and our hearts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on top of the, the, the physical stress that needs to be released, there's a mental stress that has to be released, a spiritual uh, uh, sharpening that has to take place. And that will only take place if you start to really figure out who you are, why you feel the way you do, because that's the next step after you journal is to start to look at your journal, your journal entries. Maybe if you look at them a month, you know, what did you feel last month and start to really take account of who you were then, because I guarantee there are going to be some things that you changed since that time frame. Yeah. Um, so really starting to dig into your, to your heart, into your mind. I always, you know, for, for feel like prayer is the key. In addition, if you're not praying, praying, then I always say, what are you doing? Because, you know, you can tell your, your friend and, 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 uh, and I'm not discouraging anybody to speak to others, but it's also always good to speak to God first mm -hmm. for that direction and also for asking him for discernment and figuring out who is the safe person that you should tell this thing to of how you're feeling. And because that is another step of reaching out to get the assistance that you need uh, after you start to understand yourself, but you in discerning who is that safe place that you can go to and finding that next step of a person that you feel as though God has um, put in your, in your sights as, uh, you know, and they usually just appear. I, I mean, I'm sure that you've had that happen to whereas you prayed on something and you've done the, the inner work that you needed to do. Yeah. And then something happens that's yeah. 
propels you into a better situation. So um, I definitely say do that inner work first, start to figure out why you feel the way that you do after you feel as though you've released some of this, uh, this feeling. In addition, praying for discernment, finding to find that safe person to tell how you're feeling too, that you feel as though will be able to uh, help you and have the necessary resources to, or at least refer you to the necessary resources yeah. um, so because be a you can, therapist or right it could be uh, there's hotlines there, that you yeah. can contact mm -hmm. uh can you, i always say go into your uh you could everybody has their phone at this point uh google community resources in your area and and look up what is available for you because there are services and to really start to uh figure out what it is that you're you, you need now, I'm, and this is totally different from somebody who is literally out on the street right now. That is a different type of situation and I would give different advice for that. But for those who are in a safe situation now, who are looking, you know, going through just a fog, but they are in a safe place, then I would go that route. But, and, but for those who are finding themselves in the middle of the street, yeah. and uh, that's a different type of situation, I would definitely say to reach out to, uh, to, you can always reach out to me as well on social media, uh, Justice Jules. Other people have reached out um, and when they found themselves in situations, I've connected them to community resources in their area. So I am a viable source if you find yourself in a very destitute situation as far as to find community, prepare you with a community resource that can be of assistance. So um, I definitely want to uh, extend my, my hand for that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Definitely don't feel like you have to do it all on your own. Like community people, resources, people are here to help. You don't have to struggle if you're watching and you're like, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm at a breaking point. You don't have to do it on, on your own. Right. And I, I just have to ask this. I have to ask this. Okay. Because I, I think that, and, and I tend to think this way sometimes, like I, you think that if this one thing would have been different, my life would have been better, okay? A lot of times people feel like, well, if I didn't, for me, it was my scar. For me, it was, if I didn't have my scar, then life would have been instantly better. I could have done this. I would have felt more confident doing that. And this probably would have happened. And we put a lot of, we may put a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, just, just on something that we feel like is a barrier being the reason we didn't succeed. And so right. I say that to say, because sometimes you just can't get rid of a certain situation. Sometimes the situation is, is what it is. And so I want to ask you, because everything inside of me was like, but if a parent just would have said, girl, just stay in the house, I got you. You know, when they, you came home at 13 and they would have said, you know what, we're not, we not happy about this, but going upstairs, we ain't going to talk to you for the next two days. <laughs> we're going to process this, but we're going to work it out now. No, I my got my, my parents told me, don't eat off the silverware. Okay, so no. <laughs> See, but that's my thing. So how do you feel your life may have been different, if at all, if you, if your parents would have said, you know what, I hear you. Okay, go to your room. You want punishment for two weeks, but we're going to work this out. How do you think your life may have been different? Do you think you still would have had the same level of drive? How do you feel you might have been different? I think that I would have had, um, you know, anything could have happened. And I really don't ever think about that, honestly, because I don't live in the past of that, yeah. uh, of the, of the, and I don't have any regrets in life. Um, but I would say that um, my spirit was of someone who did not, uh, did not like that type of authority over them, of having to answer to somebody else who I didn't feel as though always had what I felt in my heart I wanted to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that if, even if this situation didn't happen in this way, there was going to be some other bumping of heads 
because in my heart, the passion that I have of what I want is yeah. going to overshadow anything that's yeah. happening of, uh, in, as long as I feel like it's the right thing in my spirit yeah. um, and it's not hurting somebody, yeah. I, in essence, um, there was going to be some type of action, I think, at that point, whatever that was because that's just who I was yeah. <laughs> as a young person. So, and I still, you know, I still can be at different times when you feel like you're passionate about certain things. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you said that. I didn't expect for you to, I didn't know what you were going to say, but I love that you said that. The reason I say that I love it is because we might think that the best way is this one way and the truth is, is that, like you said, you still were going to have to, hey, I can't, I can't, I have to be who I am. And if being under this roof was not going to allow me to be who I am, I still, maybe I would have removed myself from the house. Maybe I still would have moved out. This still might have happened. So I think anytime anybody might, because I, and, and I'm, I'm so happy that you don't kind of think about the past like that in the past like I have been that person that will think about mm -hmm. the past and say well if I didn't pull that cup of coffee onto myself how would my life have been different and the thing is is that there's still going to be something that was going to be a challenge because that's you know we we're we're here for an experience in life and it's not all going to be like you know easing on down the yellow brick road you know, even, you know, but even with that, they had experiences too, you know what I'm saying? Right. So I think that's it, is that we have to understand that, okay, this is a particular challenge, it is uncomfortable, I get it, but understand, just because it, it the challenge looks like this, doesn't mean that you were just going to be challengeless. Right. So, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Preach it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's so going to be something. That's life. Yeah. And so, like you said, it's all in how you deal with it. It's all in the inner work that you have to do to navigate and, and get through and, and be powerful in that way. So I absolutely love this. What is one thing that you can say to people right now that they can start doing today to just enhance their lives? I always say affirmations are key. So I would use my affirmation and that is the one I repeat constantly. And I say it's mine because I say it all the time. <laughs> and it goes of all things lead to my success, wealth and happiness, no matter what. And I always ask people to say that to themselves all things lead to your success, wealth, and happiness, no matter what, Audra. Say it a hundred times. Let it sink into your subconscious mind and let it permeate through your body and feel it. At every, every time you say it, fill it with the same passion and that same vigor as if it were the first time. So continue on with that, uh, that mentality of greatness, that thought process of success that foundation and those principles of, of uh, propelling you to the next level that you deserve and that you need in order to really thrive and live in god's great that god's great thought of who you are supposed to be mm -hmm. because that's what it is he's already he knows what what he thought you up he knew what what it was that you were supposed to go through uh before you thought of it so continue in his path so you can get the blessings that are deserved and so that's what i would definitely say stick to those affirmations get that mindset together so when those blessings come you can accept them and you can accept them with grace as well as with uh with knowing that it's for you yeah i love that that is amazing how can people get in touch with you you can reach me on social media, Just Us Jewels. I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, twi twi uh, <laughs> Twitter, <laughs> as well as Clubhouse. Um, so definitely connect with me as well as LinkedIn. So connect with me there. Awesome. Thank you so much. You done dropped some jewels on me today. And Thank it, you. I, I appreciate your time. Your story is very powerful. 
and get the book so you can get the whole story so you can get all of the jewels and and you're absolutely right your your mindset it it just really how you see your journey and and your level of faith as it pertains to your journey is just so important so thank you so much for being here and sharing sharing your story and your time with me i appreciate you well thank you i appreciate you have for you for having me and i definitely look forward to connect with connecting with you further and i'm having you on survivor shows too absolutely yeah.